Our next speaker is Christine D, who uh, teaches uh, at Fitchburg State University. Fitch Excuse me, in Fitchburg, Maryland. Has a doctorate from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, she has a doctorate and she is the author of the recent book published by Ohio University Press, which also publishes the books in the, in the, for this series, and that is Ohio's War, A History of Civil War Documents in Ohio. And uh, Christine will be talking about Lincoln's Land, and uh, I had uh, a drink with her last night, and maybe because uh, it was a drink and then a second drink. Uh, it seemed to be the, the most fascinating thing that I've heard of in years, that after all of these unbelievable number of books on the Civil War and Lincoln, that none of us could all read if we spent nothing but reading Civil War for the rest of our lives. She's come up with something really new and interesting. And so, uh, here's Christine. introduction. Fitchburg, Massachusetts happens to be slightly northwest of Boston, so go Red Sox, go Bruins. Uh, enough said. I had to throw that in for Paul. I want to thank everyone here for the opportunity to speak. Today I'd like to speak about Lincoln and the environment. This paper seeks to probe the relationship of how Lincoln viewed the environment and how he used his understanding of the natural and man-made environment in his politics. from Springfield to Washington, to the battlefields in Maryland, to speak at a cemetery in Pennsylvania, and so on. And as we all know, it was a train that took him back to Illinois. In my mind's eye, I see Lincoln in a train car looking out on the geography and the changing landscape, the rural places, the urban places, the land that he had measured and litigated as a surveyor and a lawyer, and I wonder. I wonder about this man of rural beginnings, who is to slavery and I think that Lincoln definitely I've heard about his incorporated Whig ideas linking agriculture and industry with the improvements as he started his career in state politics. Then, to argue against popular sovereignty and the spread of slavery. And finally, in articulating the contours of a union without slavery and selling a vision of that, of that world to a society at war. From Lincoln's first foray into politics, we see an early indication of the relationship, his relationship to the environment and how he turned this knowledge to political ends. When he introduced himself to voters in his unsuccessful 1830, improve the environment through technology. Passionate 
about He saw them as something our imagination may be heated at. Just the thought of it, he wrote, brought pleasing anticipations when he wrote about railroads. Yet this pragmatic young Whig, always with an eye to economics, um, and this reiterates one of the points that Amy made earlier this morning about how he first and foremost was interested in his early per- career in economic issues, this pragmatic Whig acknowledged that the costs of constructing railroads were shocking. So shocking to render it inappropriate to St. Gammon County's infant resources. So what did Lincoln do? He presented Plan B. Plan B was improving the course of the river that ran through the county. And Lincoln maintained that he was just the person to do it, which was the key element of why he should be elected to the state legislature. He wrote, for my peculiar circumstances, it is probable that for the last 12 months I have given as particular water in this river any other person in built and piloted a flat to internal improvements. But for Lincoln, what was critical here was taking action. The founding fathers, he said, had gained possession of the land, which made it all possible. It made it possible to construct, quote, a political edifice of liberty and equal rights as he explained to a young man. Human history was, and that Americans were in peaceful possession of the fairest portion of the earth because they were legal inheritors of what he termed goodly land. But while the revolutionary generation built his generation inherited. They were active, his contemporaries were passive. By his accounting, 19th century Americans were lacking. Lincoln then detailed how contemporary society had departed from the rule of law. He argued Americans took for granted the success of the experiment in Republican government. Founding the Republic was like a hunt or a chase, he maintained. As he explained, the game is caught, and I believe it is true that with the catching and the pleasures of the chase. Now, if the hunt metaphor was not enough, he furthered his point by moving from the hunt to the harvest. He said the field of glory is harvested and the crop is already appropriated, he wrote, referring to the founders, but new reapers will arise and they too will seek a field. tied together in a mutually official partnership that was supported by government protection, government promotion, and with the idea that government, with government aid, Americans could make orderly what was wild. And that's one of the points he'll later make in Cincinnati on his way to Washington in 61 when he's speaking in support of the Homestead legislation. steady employment for farmers and workers, as well as markets for their product. Now, in this idea of the open field, this open field of opportunities, I can now turn to a fascinating um, refutal, rebuttal that he had of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. With the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, it seemed to Lincoln that the open field was threatened. Indeed, in response to Kansas-Nebraska, Lincoln drew an, on an agricultural allegory in an editorial for the Illinois Journal. He argued that the legislation, by repealing the Missouri's Compromise, the Missouri Compromise Prohibition on Slavery North of 3630, 
was tantamount to the destruction of private property. And in this case, the private property was a hypothetical meadow. In a parable, he writes that Abraham Lincoln once upon a time owned land, as did John C. Calhoun. Indeed, they once held the land in common. They had agreed to divide the land in an agreement that was, in Lincoln's words, sacred. Lincoln's peace was, he described, a fine meadow. It contained water. It contained springs that were beautiful. Moreover, it was well fenced, clearly important to the surveyor and lawyer who specialized in uh, land law. It had been, in essence, improved upon, ordered, and was bountiful. On the other hand, for his part, John C. Calhoun owned a large herd of cattle, but the land for the cattle was exhausted. It was dried up, Lincoln said. It was barren. It lacked water. What did Calhoun do, Lincoln writes? Calhoun looked with a jealous eye toward the fertility and the abundance that was Lincoln's land and took down the fence between the two. Starving and ravished when asked a question about his motives, asserted that he did nothing but remove the fence. He did not intend to either drive the cattle in or keep them out, but let them perfectly free to form their own motion, notions. Calhoun, Lincoln suggested, was a fool to believe that anyone in the country thought that the fence not pulled down was not pulled down to open the meadow to cattle, or indeed the popular sovereignty was passed uh, to do nothing less than allow slavery into the territories. He reiterated that same point later when he addressed a crowd in Springfield for the state fair. But this time, in addition to cattle, he added in some pigs. Popular sovereignty, sovereignty he wrote, was as insensible as tearing down a fence and not anticipating that hogs or cattle would rush into the field. He suggested animals, especially hogs, would certainly know better and that so long as men believed that they were a higher order in the animal, the same Republicans in the state elections in 1859. He also drew on his knowledge of the environment to connect with his audience and to criticize Democrats and Stephen A. Douglas in particular. He gave a speech in Columbus, Ohio, where he criticized Douglas for minimizing the impact that slavery could have on the territories. And in doing so, he chose to draw a parallel between allowing slavery into federal territories and agricultural invasion, an invasive species, in this case, the Canada thistle. Lincoln knew what he was doing with Canada thistle. Initially, I did not when I discovered this, but I had to learn what was going on with Canada thistle. And this was uh, the situation. Lincoln made his point with the audience, um, and, he under, and they understood that. Because Lincoln argued that Canada thistle was like, had the effect on the land, as if the first man who goes into it may plant a thing there which, like the Canada thistle or some other of these pests of the soil, cannot be dug up by the millions of men who will come thereafter. Slavery's potential to infect the territories similar to Canada thistle infecting fields. Now, the reason this comparison resonated with his audience was because Lincoln chose something that was extremely familiar to 19th century farmers. The Canada thistle was known in Lincoln's lifetime and for decades after as an invasive species that had a, a root system that both went deep and spread out across the land. Because it traveled deeply and widely, it effectively choked out, or at least impeded the growth of crops, those crops that were useful, marketable. Some writers called for vigilance in eradicating it and preventing its spread. Others bemoaned that the founders of the country, the former farmers and previous generations, had not done more to stop the spread of Canada thistle. Others pressed for government action against Canada thistle, and indeed suggested that legislative remedies were appropriate. They called for forced eradication at property's owner's expense. 
suggesting government action and the, to a certain extent, violation of private property rights for the greater good. environment continued to provide parameters for his thinking on the relationship of slavery to the Union war effort. In the fall of 1862, Lincoln was busy drafting his second message to Congress amidst what was a dark and troubling period for the Union war effort. It seems that in this address, Lincoln and his pundits alike expected much. The document was written in the critical months after the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, a month, a scant month before emancipation would go into effect. It was written after significant Democratic gains in off-year elections, and while Lincoln was also reviewing convictions of Sioux from the uprising in Minnesota. as much. Now historians have had varied views about Lincoln's address. Most focus and hone right in on the idea of compensated emancipation for the border states and rightfully so. Formal reports from departments which David Donald found, quote, a puzzling tribute to the Middle West, close quote. And historians have argued that these were digressions before moving on to the real topic compensated emancipation. Moreover, this second address to Congress, December 1st, 1862, is most often remembered for the concluding paragraphs, the moving concluding understanding of the land and its relationship to the Union, the address becomes more revealing. And that's what I'd like to do uh, in the remainder of this presentation. In the first portion of the address, Lincoln's dealing with diplomatic news, and he's listing treaties and agreements, and then swiftly in the address, the ground shifts. In a passage marked by its passivity, Lincoln notes, quote, applications have been made to me and those applications were made to him, passively, by free blacks who want to emigrate and embark on discussion, and emigrate, and he embarks them on a discussion of colonization. And it marks, I think, his continued discomfort with imagining an environment without slavery, but with free blacks. He expresses regrets that colonists of African descent from here the only countries that had agreed diplomatically to receive them, but remains optimistic that there would be, as he said, a considerable migration of blacks from the United States to both places. Then he returns to diplomatic issues and extols, and after he dispenses with some more diplomatic notes, he begins to extol the value and richness of America's western lands, especially mineral deposits, and calls for more government support in extracting mineral resources. Then there's a section with a considerable amount of accounting of government. In this manner, he frames the loss of life and property that he blames on the Sioux uprising in Minnesota, noting that Minnesota residents wanted Indians removed and suggests Congress should revisit the Indian policy. At the same moment, he's lauding the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad and supports the expansion of the Illinois and Michigan Canal. He also tosses out a bone, if you will, to the new Department of Agriculture 
And as Lincoln frames it, this new small Department of Agriculture will benefit what he calls a large class of our most valuable citizens. It will become valuable, he predicts, to all Americans because it will advance the knowledge of technology and its applications in agriculture. Having then established in this address the country's secure diplomacy, the potential prosperity and security of Western territories, dispensed with Native American descent and offered government growth and technology to secure agricultural prosperity for free labor, Lincoln then moves to the matter of slave labor within the Union. He immediately returns to a familiar theme, that the nation rests upon land, concrete, actual land, which is more durable than either people or laws. It is for Lincoln, as he says, this ever enduring part, the makes the very existence in the first inaugural that separation is a geographical impossibility. And then he most forcefully articulates his vision of an American land, ever bit the former surveyor and lawyer, and it's a land that is at once intact and unblemished. It's undivided by natural division or boundary, and it has within it a place where the culture of corn and cotton meet. This is the great interior of the body republic, he writes. And in Lincoln's vision, the vast center must be kept intact to benefit those Americans not only who live at the center geographically, but also those who live on the coast, those who rely on the interior for resources, for markets, and for transportation. Far from a meaningless ode to his native Midwestern region, Lincoln is providing a vision of the American land that parallels his earlier, politi his earlier economic arguments that production and trade link together agriculture and industry. It links together east and west and north and south. And I believe that this environmental vision is an important element that sustains Lincoln. It's not the land or its differences, or as he refers to it as, our national homestead that is the problem. That can be improved upon, it can be controlled, it can be ordered. It's in fact not the land that's the problem, he says, but the people. Specifically, people's diversity of opinions with regards to slavery. This has to be grappled with, he tells, he tells Congress, by extension, the American readership. It has to be grappled with because without slavery, the war would not continue. And he's looking on the war from this perspective in December of 62, a month away from emancipation going into effect. He offers up a plan of gradual compensated emancipation that he argues has virtue and merit. It allows the states to choose a timetable. It would eliminate the possibility that those people who are opposed to the end of slavery would become deranged. It eliminates many blacks from vagrant destitution, and those are the words he uses, by not allowing them to become free, but yet giving them the sort of feel good um, knowledge that their children and grandchildren would. It would spread the cost over time and over the northern and southern portions of the country because he argues both sections have in fact benefited from slavery. It also respects property rights. It respects property rights that people had inherited by owning slaves. And once again, he reiterates the feasibility of colonization. I believe in this message coming after his geographical explanation for the power of the Union and its benefits, I believe that what he's doing is he's grounding compensated emancipation and colonization in a positive vision of the vast American continent's potential, its potential for population growth, its potential to increase wealth, and the potential that it has for free labor. Now, still we're left with the question, what is to be made of this message? Is it a break with the past or truly a call to think anew, as Lincoln says is one of the last paragraphs? Well, historian Philip Paladin has suggested that this message is fascinating, 
It was Lincoln, and he writes, looking over his shoulder wistfully at a world he was leaving, or perhaps lingering over the memory of a road he knew just before being propelled onto a new path. He sees in this message of gradualism, of, state, of a state role in compensated emancipation, Lincoln's effort to contain and to order what seemed like an escalating pace of change. He sees Lincoln offering a process he truly desired and felt comfortable with before he faced prospects of events controlling him. Others have suggested that Lincoln was devising a way to move from slavery to freedom that was forward-looking, but in a way that sought a political center in an effort to retain popular support in the border states, in essence to frame radical change in a way that was more palatable to the public. I think if we read the message as a whole, with an eye toward his view of the land and its resources, and its relationship to the Union, we see elements of both of those things, but also something more. We see Lincoln in a time of uncertainty, reaching for what had created him and sustained him. The land of the center, the idea of a geography united by river and rail, and the open field that offered a fair chance for labor. Now, while some historians have seen in Lincoln an antipathy toward agriculture and land, I believe that misses a critical element of Lincoln's political genius. That Lincoln was politically able to use his surveyor and a circuit rider out in Illinois, as well as through his campaigns and his travels. I believe he was able to use this knowledge as he meandered along rivers and dusty roads by foot, on horseback, in buckboard, by canal and rail, to his advantage. He could speak of the land to a rural America and thereby feel uncomfortable footing in speaking of union. And it was this message that he chose, I think, in this vision that he offered January 1st, 1863, and what he had been ground by war, and that was a union without slavery, but a union with free blacks, and what that meant for America. And I think at this point in late 1862, Lincoln was uncertain about that meaning himself, and he looked to what he knew, and that was the land and its geography and its resources, its economic value, and the vast potential that that land held for America. So thank you very much. Questions? We have time for a couple. Uh, I agree. That was a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Relationship.
he actively was not pushing that sort of, but Lincoln's, um, I think, political approach, and he's interested in what it means for the republic. He doesn't seem to be getting his hands dirty, if you will, on domestic policy matters. You know, though both of those things are long-held Republican uh, planks that Congress is putting through, but I don't see him, for example, campaigning for that the same way he does for the 13th Amendment. Is he doing it for his audience? You know, personally, on both fronts, I think the answer is both. You know, as a shrewd politician, he's always picking examples that are going to resonate with his audience. But I think just like his use of religion tells us something significant about America's religious nature, their beliefs, um, value systems in his era, I think the fact that he uses these environmental metaphors I mean, not just of the land, but also the built environment, you know, the improvements, the railroads, things of that nature. I think that tells us something significant about America's consciousness of the environment, um, and people like Marsh and their thinking on the environment. Am I saying that he is, you know, an environmental activist? No. Um, but I do think that, that the metaphors people use and the choices that they make in their writing and their language mean something, and it tells us something both about themselves and also the people that are listening to him. I was waiting to hear you talk about the parallel with Thomas Jefferson. extols the yeoman farmer? Is that the question? I mean, I think my knee-jerk response to that is going to be that there's a long tradition in America of extolling agriculture as something more pure. Mm -hmm. 
of the of the presidents. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly, you know, Franklin Pierce came in on the railroad too. I mean, the reason that I'm struck by an image of Lincoln on the railroad is because historians we seem to do, we seem to divide artificially along, you know. Lincoln, the rural, the rustic, um, sort of hailing from the log cabin and, and rural poverty, and Lincoln as a tool of corporate law and the railroad corporations, um, assuming like an opposition between capital and labor in a Marxist view. And sometimes I think that misses the fabric of early 19th century America and how they were tied together. And I think that's why Lincoln holds both together in his mind intellectually. Sure. Your talk was so fabulous, I never thought about Lincoln's thinking in that way. Well, I never thought about the Mexican War in that way either, so. Uh, and I mean, obviously I'm much more of a scholar of the Mexican War than of Lincoln, but uh, Lincoln scholars have said that maybe he was a little bit more basically saying to, you know, stepbrother, like, you're a loser, right? And you can't take mom's money and just go off somewhere. I think it was Missouri he wanted to take off to and leave her, you know, impoverished. And he thinks that his father, in essence, didn't work hard. But I think for Lincoln, you know, one of the reasons during the war, he's so familiar there with his, um, as Gene was saying, he asked for the big map route, right? To hold the maps and he's strategizing and he's following maps just because he's somebody who studies maps and studies geography and how to integrate those agricultural areas into small market centers, larger market centers. Um, yeah, so that, that's the approach that um, I take on it rather than him rejecting whole cloth his family's rural agricultural past. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.